Hello and welcome to Narrative Design, the secret source of storytelling, uh, video game storytelling, I should say. So today we're going to be uh, talking to uh, Shella Ramanan, uh, Tori Schaefer, Sarah Longthorne, and uh, we were supposed to have Jim Rossignol, uh, but unfortunately he's uh, had to duck out for a personal reason. Um, so to begin with, I'll introduce everyone. I'll start with Tori. Tori worked on uh, the Elder Scrolls Online's expansions, including writing a quest that nabbed the first ever highly respected uh, GLAAD award for outstanding representation of the LGBT community in a video game. Uh, more recently, she's been working on Spellbreak for PC and PS4, which launched into beta recently. Quick check in, Tori, did I sum everything up well? Yep. Um, yep, that's my experiences. Cool. Uh... Uh, cool. So uh, Shella has uh, bridged the gap between being a successful game journalist and a narrative designer. She's now one half of the team behind the upcoming game Before I Forget, uh, while also designing narratives for Ubisoft Massive. She's a co-founder of uh, Poc in Play and was recognized for her contribution to diversity in the field with the Game Dev Heroes Award recently. So Shella, anything to add to that? No, I think you've covered it. Yes, okay, I did my research well. Uh, and Sarah is a narrative designer with uh, what I found to be a weird and wonderful catalogue of work, uh, having worked as part of RuneScape's Law Council, which just sounds amazing, On uh, uh, also having worked on the video game adaptation of Love Island, completely different, and on an occult game called Cthulhu Chronicles. Currently, she's working on secret projects for Sumo Digital here in the UK. Anything I missed off there, Sarah? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. <laughs> All right, three for three. I've nailed it. So finally, uh, my name is Anthony Default. Uh, I make games as one half of Far Few Giants, and our game Ring of Fire is part of Ludo Narrowcon at the moment. Uh, I'm also Wireframe Magazine's writing narrative design columnist. But other than that, I'm all-round much less interesting or accomplished than any of the people on the, that I've swindled into joining this panel. Uh, so a few pre-apologies for unprofessionalism straight off the bat. Uh, it's likely that at some point, as it did before the call, uh, before the uh, the panel just now, uh, my totally bald cat might come and try and attack or cuddle me. Uh, so if that happens, it'll derail us, but we'll we'll, we'll make it back. Uh, to begin with, uh, oh, I just wanted to say as well, at the end of the uh, panel, I'm going to try and make time for a question or two from the audience. So uh, put the questions in the chat. I will try and monitor it and uh, grab whichever ones are most interesting. Um, so make sure to be putting those in throughout. Uh, and to begin with, uh, we're going to try and define narrative design. That should, in theory, be the key question that people are here for. So uh, as a group, I want a concise definition that we can all agree on. Uh, I'm going to pretend I know nothing, because I secretly do know nothing. And uh, let's get started. So I'm not going to single anyone out. I want you to, to uh, jump in here. Uh, what is narrative design? Designing the narrative. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, uh, uh, we wrapped it up actually. Uh, so if we can end, no, go on, give I me know, a better I, definition. I've always felt that narrative design was quite an intuitive, does what it says on the tin sort of word. If we preclude writing, um, then it is um, what happens in your story, how you communicate that story, and how you play with and explore the themes of that story through design. Um, that's that's how I would do it. Maybe someone else disagreed. Okay, <laughs> as a as a complete novice to narrative design, uh, I am not yet clear on exactly what you mean. So perhaps someone else can can offer a, a more uh, explain like I'm five definition. Um. I'd say it's ensuring that the mechanics and systems of the game support the narrative and vice versa. So it's like a holistic okay. um, view of the game and those two sides. Um, so what does that look like? Like you sit down at your desk, how do you do a narrative design? How do you do a narrative design? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, gosh. Okay, so you decide. Okay. Yeah, jump in. Go, Tori. Oh, 
So uh, like it all starts with documents, right? You document what you're going to do in an outline. So instead of just writing a story, which is like an outline of the narrative beats, you outline the story, like the game mechanics that are going to support your story. So you would say like, okay, we'll have the NPC say this introduction and they will give this information. And then we'll have a combat encounter and then once you finish that combat encounter, that NBC will give you more information. So you're kind of outlining how the gameplay is going to tell the narrative rather than just what the narrative is itself. Like Shella said, completely integrating all those things, world building, uh, combat design, you know, um, art decisions and writing, of course, you know, um, dialogue, everything kind of comes together and you say how all those elements are going to combine to tell your story. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you have nailed it. Let's, uh, let's try and get that into a shorter bite-sized chunk that would fit in a tweet or something. So uh, I'm getting that it is not writing. It is more uh, telling, basically telling a story in a game sans the writing part. Uh, so just the design and the mechanics how can we get that into like 10 words i mean if you want to get real pithy but you don't want to be that informative then you could say it's where narrative and game design collide okay that sounds uh like an excellent tagline yeah. for like a, a narrative design agency or something I definitely what, steal what that. The book cover. yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay all right i think we've sort of designed it, uh, designed it, defined it, hopefully. We've narrative so designed this. <laughs> we have narrative designed the concept of narrative design. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's jump in with some questions. Um, I'm going to throw this one to Shella off the bat. Uh, have you ever designed the setting? Oh, sorry, no, Tori. Have you ever designed the setting or story of a game specifically to facilitate a gameplay element? Yeah, so this is really interesting with um, Spellbreak, which is a PvP battle royale game um, that we are currently designing narrative content for, which is a really interesting thing that we're doing, something completely new. Um, still kind of in that phase of deciding what that means, but um, uh, the story tells us a world, this fantasy world of mages who use elemental powers with these gauntlets and um, there was this cataclysmic event called the fracture. So basically like this giant thing happened and earthquakes and it destroyed the entire land. So the reason why the hollow lands, which is where you battle is so empty and there's nobody there, but the mages who are fighting is because of this cataclysmic event. And then this event created this thing called the spell storm. So the spell storm is this magical energy that like surrounds the area and gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's basically the reason why the people, the refugees who survived the fracture can't return home. As you know, in Battle Royale, the concept of your battle royale area getting smaller and smaller and smaller is, is a, a key component of Battle Royale. So we've added that into our lore. And, you know, the questions we want our players to ask is, what is the spell storm? Why was it created? What exactly does it do? So we're creating like a very common battle royale element, but we're putting that within our narrative and our story. And then we're creating content on top of that, asking more questions about it. So it doesn't feel like it's just a mechanic. It feels really integral to the story's plot and to the world's like, you know, the, the conflict within the world. That's really interesting. I liked the, uh, the way you described that you started with this game mechanic that you knew you wanted to have in there did the the law kind of justification for it i guess and then that itself raised questions which changed other things about presumably like missions or quests in the game or some other part of its gameplay design is that right it's informing the few we haven't added there to design yet we are very much in the concept phases of that and but right. you know that's a question that we want to answer or we want the players to ask and we want to answer in different ways you know lore appropriate you know characters having theories and things like that um and it's just a battle royale element that we you know created to be more something more in the narrative that's really really interesting um so sarah i was going to ask you what your favorite bit of narrative design that you've ever done is 
Okay. Uh, so um, I'd say my favorite thing that I've worked on that I can talk about um, is it's got to be the Love Island game. Um, and I absolutely can't take credit for a, a lot of what I'm going to say here because it was like such a team effort and everyone was so talented. Um, but basically season two of the Love Island game really built upon season one, which was very linear. Season two was uh, very fluid and variable and responsive and quite um, modular in a lot of ways. Um, we were quite, um, uh, we were quite ambitious with it. <laughs> and uh, sometimes that caused problems, but you know, uh, it was also just really exciting. Um, what I particularly enjoyed about this project was um, we were really thinking about, okay, like Love Island, the show, what is this about? This is about burgeoning relationships. This is about testing those relationships and um, what it means to really like someone or start to like someone. Um, and in the world of Love Island, there's this whole thing about your type on paper, uh, which is uh, who you'd theoretically like if you haven't met them yet. Um, and we thought, okay, in this context of Love Island, uh, what are the kind of factors that people might be considering in terms of personality? Uh, and we narrowed it down to three. So we said, okay, um, you know, it's about how extra you are. It's about how loyal you are. Um, and it's also a little bit about how glamorous you are. So when players are making choices, yeah, we're thinking, okay, they said this, so this is going to happen down the road. Uh, and we're thinking, yeah, okay, they said this, so they're getting brownie points for this character. But we're also thinking about who that player is and the identity they are forming for themselves. Um, and we really wanted to give the NPCs, the love interest in this game, some agency. It's not just about whoever you like, they will like you back. Um, they have a say in this as well. We wanted to make it organic. So each of the NPCs has their own type. And uh, as we're measuring who you are, we're measuring you up against these people. Um, and one of my favorite things uh, that I did for this game was um, this episode where basically you and your partner sit down and audit your relationship. Um, and it could have been that you've cheated on them. It could have been that you've you know, done some nasty stuff to each other. Um, your relationship can be in any of several places. Um, and by the end of this conversation, there are five different outcomes. Uh, and the way that we decided this was actually kind of similar to how they decide the ending for Life is Strange 2. Um, you have that climactic, decisive moment where you decide whether you want to be with them or not. Um, but there's still that mysterious element of like, okay, but what does that mean? Just because you want to be with them doesn't mean they want to be with you. Just because you don't want to be with them doesn't mean they're happy about it. If either of you doesn't want to be with the other, then you split up. Um, but there's always some flavor there. So it might be that one of you gets your heart broken. Um, and we decided uh, what that would be through like a bunch of, like there was like two pages of logic, <laughs> or actually more than that for this scene, um, which a lot of players like didn't even realize, um, but we were really trying to nail down exactly how your relationship has gone. Um, and the thing that I just really enjoyed about working on this was, I mean, it put a lot of our systems to the test. Um, it exploited this really fragile push and pull of human relationships through its, you know, sheer design. Um, and it made me feel really good at maths. So yeah, I'd say that's my favorite thing that I've worked on. That's, that sounds really cool. The thing that interests me the most about that, I think, is um, the, the idea that you can build this relationship throughout the whole game. And then it comes down to this choice of, do you want to stay with them at the end? But the other character has agency to say no, and you can't, like the player can't predict that. I'm wondering how you, as a follow-up question, kind of how you designed those endings so that the the negative outcome of the breakup was still satisfactory as a as like a story and a play experience. Um, I think a lot of that comes down to where we put it in the narrative. So um, the thing about Love Island is that you have um, the whole narrative has like is formulated is formulated around like these punctuation marks, which are the recouplings and the dumpings. Um, so that moment came quite close before one of these recouplings. So um, if you do break up and it really sucks, then we have like a short amount of time where we can um, branch on the player, being able to you know work through how they feel about it. Um, but then very shortly after that, you have the ability to potentially move on with someone else. Um, so it's, you know, we're not lingering too much having to branch like loads. 
um and you know but um generally the player is able to sort of carry on with their life <laughs> that sounds awesome um so Shella, i wanted to ask you what your favorite example of narrative design in someone else's work is so it's, i guess where we all get to nerd out and appreciate someone else's stuff <laughs> Um, I think people who know me will not be surprised when I say what remains of Edith Finch. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's a narrative designer's game as well. Um, yeah, and I mean, there are loads of beautiful moments in that game where the, the narrative design is just um, pure joy and genius and amazing. But particularly the, the cannery scene, um, Lewis's scene, where um, it's a char character who works in a factory where they can salmon and um, he loses himself in his imagination to escape the sort of the sort of mundane of his his job which is just um, moving salmon from one side of the screen to the other and there's a sort of um, guillotine thing chopping the heads off and so what they did was they um, they separated the controls. So as he's um, sort of getting away in his imagination, this sort of, um, this cloud appears with the imaginary world, which is this medieval fairy tale world of um, sort of kings and queens and castles and serpents. And meanwhile, there's the, the salmon coming from left to right. And so your right hand controls the salmon and your left hand controls the, um, the character in the fantasy world. And as Lewis sort of loses himself in this imaginary world, the imaginary world becomes more, more clear and the, 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 the factory kind of slips away. Um, and there's lots of clever things it does. So it plays with themes um, uh, because um, when you first enter the world, it's a top down, uh, very simple black and white maze. And so it's like this evolution of um, adventure gaming through this imaginary world, because then it becomes um, an isometric view and there's color and there's sound and there's music. And then it goes through to third person. And then finally, by the end, it's in first person. So um, it's really cool, like nerdy game dev thing of like exploring that um, evolution. And then um, I've read interviews um, with the developers and um, about how they how they managed these two sides and how um, they ensured that players didn't kind of uh, get confused because at first they might focus on um, the fantasy world because I think it's more engaging it's more sort of immediate and then the fish kind of <laughs> fall by the wayside so or when they're first doing the fish they're just like right I got to chop fish chopping fish and they don't notice the imaginary world comes up so they used audio um, so there's a narrator um, saying who's reading a, a letter aloud um, in the real world there's so many layers in what remains of Edith Finch because there's like another world <laughs> beyond Lewis's world but our present day in the game but um, so there's a narrator and the, the, the words tail off of this interesting sentence and the last word doesn't, doesn't come until you go, oh, okay, I have to interact with this, this, this uh, sort of fantasy world. And that's when that starts moving. And then you suddenly realize, oh, I have two worlds to operate here. Um, so yeah, it's just a really clever, uh, beautiful piece of game design or narrative design, all those things. And I think um, the testament to the narrative design is that you can you can watch a let's play of what remains of Edith Finch, um, but because the game mechanics are so integral to that experience, you really are missing so much, such a huge chunk of that game that it isn't the same at all. Um, and I think that's yeah the the power of that design. Before I go in with a, a follow-up question, I just want to give uh, our other panelists uh, an opportunity if they want to jump in and say anything else about that game or link it to another. No? Okay. Tori? Oh, Tori's going for it. Oh, Tori, we can't hear you. No. Can anyone else hear Tori? No. I don't think she can hear us. Oh, uh, well, anyway, what I was going to ask you, sorry, Tori, uh, Spencer, could you um, try and get hold of her in the chat? Uh, 
what I was going to ask you, Shella, was um, about the uh, the part you were talking about where it goes through the uh, evolution of, of adventure games, um, and uh, how you think that, like, why has that been put in? Do you think how is that adding to Spencer's story? Not Spencer, the Spencer. Lewis, I think. Yeah. <laughs> You're thinking of Spencer so much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, well, it's kind of poking at that, um, that anxiety about games and gamers um, sort of losing, losing themselves in their imaginary world. So it's, that's, it's doing, that's one thing that, that this whole sequence is doing. And then the evolution of video games, is, I think it's just, well, Giant Sparrow, the developers are, um, they're preoccupied with storytelling and how we tell stories. And obviously adventure, adventure games have, you know, how those stories have evolved. And I think, yeah, so I think it's just exploring those different ways that uh, we tell stories within games because that's what Giant Sparrow's games do all the time. Um, they're constantly exploring that. I mean, in their games, you you literally climb inside the pages of books and the words litter the screen. They're sort of like tactile parts of the, the world. And I think it's just another layer of, of that. I don't know if other people have theories on that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. It's uh, I, I, I've had some frustration with the Edith Ed Ed Finch game because uh, my wife, uh, doesn't play many games, but she played and loved uh, Firewatch, and I keep trying to get her to play Edith Finch. Is like this is the next level, uh, but I just I can't get her to do it. Um, that bring brings us on to our next question, actually. Uh, so I, I guess we've kind of covered what is the state of the art. I think the video has gone wrong because Tori is not here, but hopefully she comes back. There we go. Um, hey, sorry uh, about that, guys. My mic uh, stopped working, and I had to leave and come back. <laughs> No worries, Tori. Uh, so we kind of define the state of the art, and um, I want to get us talking about what the next step is. So what is the future of narrative design? What do you see in that future? I know Sarah was um, uh, chomping in the bit to, to talk about one of her favorite games and how that's paving the way. Um, I guess what I'd really like to see is even more of like a merge of um, game mechanics and a narrative like we see in games like What Remains of Edith Finch. So um, one game that I was really excited about was Neocab. Um, and if like anyone hasn't played it, it's basically an Uber simulator and you are the taxi driver um, and you have this little like bracelet thing that's kind of showing you through like a color code how you're feeling. Um, and how you're feeling adapts depending on your choices and how other people treat you. And it's kind of this ripple effect of like, you know, I said this and like I'm thinking about this thing. And so this affects the way I'm feeling, uh, which affects the, the choices I have, of how I talk to other people, which affects the way they treat me. And then I feel this way and, you know, yada, yada. Um, but what's really interesting about it, like I'm, I'm very interested in emotions anyway, and it just got me thinking, like, what if you had a, a greater link between um, gameplay in like in games where they have more gameplay, let's say a combat game uh, and the narrative. So as an example, like what if you had um, like an emotional magic system in combat um, where uh, the sort of magic you could do was influenced by the choices you were making in the narrative and the way that that made you feel like say like in, in the narrative you've been trying to you know keep a very clear head you've been trying to exercise emotional control and restraint um then maybe in like combat you would have like the ability to you know be more precise whereas if you've got like the whole world burning inside you then you can like do these like crazy attacks and you know potentially with the risk of like friendly fire um this is like coming from <laughs> the mind of someone who is like again very interested in like emotion and its application and um it's just like a random idea i had um but it made me think like a game like that where um the narrative is so tied into the gameplay that you can't really separate them that you can't say i'm playing this for the story or i'm playing this for the for the gameplay because they, they're kind of the same thing. And I think that, you know, like with What Remains of Edith Finch, we're going to see more games like 
uh, close that gap. So they're going to be one and the same thing. And that was just a crazy little example I had. But yeah. Yeah, I, I really that. like that. I, I felt like um, the Banner Saga almost went down this route with uh, uh, I what I really wanted to happen in the Banner Saga is for not only the um, the choices that I made in the like interactive narrative parts to affect the the kind of state of my troops when I put took them into the 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 battle phase, I really really wanted things that happened in the battle phase to then be also reflected in the narrative and have that really good tie because I felt I feel like it did do it the one way around in a way that similar to what you're describing where the emotional state of like a one of your Val followers could in a few occasions change their stats uh in in the battle part but um i guess what you're talking about is just a, a full evolution of that right yeah so something like just quite systemic where it's almost like gauging your emotional state like you would in something like neocab but and yet applying that to you know maybe the kind of actions available in gameplay and you know combat's just the first thing that came to my head and you know not all games have to be combat there are so many applications um but it's just like you know as someone who's very interested in emotion um i loved what they did with neocab and i i thought it was like an amazing testing ground for like what other sort of things we can do with those kinds of systems um and yeah, like I think anyone could have like so many different ideas from that. Um, and those are the kind of things that I want to see explored. That's wonderful. Uh, I want to give Tori a, a chance to answer this question as well, seeing as uh, you, you were talking for quite a while before, uh, I think before you realized that you weren't coming through. So uh, yeah, um, I'm coming through now though. You all can- You are, yeah. Your... Okay, we good. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I like, I, I, I think, that um my husband actually just played through outer wilds which is critically acclaimed i know so i'm sure but um we were watching the documentary and they were talking about how they really like the idea of creating a game with no objectives and that the objectives are just curiosity right the player is just curious about what this world is and what's going on and what the narrative is and everything that you do is just because you're curious and my husband you know playing through this game that's exactly how he felt he was you know he loves space we watch star trek and all those you know the expanse we love it um and he was just like i'm on the spaceship i want to go to that planet and then he would go to that planet and he would explore it and he would read things and he would listen you know to, and you like see the environment and like take in what's happening and um, everything that was narratively designed was just to give you more information about this world. And nobody ever tells you, oh, you need to find this. You need to go here. This is your objective. And in fact, I had preconceived notions of what the objective was going to be um, because it is a time loop where every 22 minutes, um, you know, the sun goes supernova <laughs> and um, you have to, you know, that's, 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 and you replay the 22 minutes based off this other uh, lore bit. Um, and so I was like, oh, I know exactly like, you know, what you're doing and what you're going to find out. And like, you know, I had these, these notions in my head and they all just turned out to be like, you know, just completely different from what I thought it was going to be, which was really fun to experience too. So I think those kinds of, what is your end goal and what your objectives are and how the narrative presents that and how the narrative design facilitates that. I think we can do so much more than just like on the top left hand of your screen, this objective list of kill five bandits or five, like find five pieces of gold, you know, um, and not to say that there, that those things need to go away <laughs> or that those things aren't valid. They totally are. But I just love this idea that narrative design can go beyond that and create these worlds where you just want to explore and do something and find out the themes and the answers and the characters because you just want to. It's just, it's not a list you have to complete. It's just this innate want of doing that, you know? Yeah. I One thing I really liked about that game, just to add on to that point, is um, I it never pointed me towards it, but there is actually a, a kind of objective list that exists in the game. Uh, but it's not in the main UI layer or anything. You have to go into the ship, uh, look opposite the main console where you would fly the ship, and then go onto a little computer system that the game never points you towards, at least I don't think. Uh, and then there's like this weird spider web 
map that's a bit like Fez's world map um, uh, that connects all the different ideas in the game. But I only ended up using that once I'd already discovered as much as I could in that game. And I just wanted more and I wanted to know what direction to look in. Um, it's And it's also a nice bit of differentiation in terms of difficulty. Like the game doesn't need difficulty settings really because of it, because uh, it allows you if, you if you need that extra support with the deductions to, to go in. Yeah, I just thought it was a fascinating bit of design. Anyway, next question. Um, Shella, you uh, were telling me that you've taken narrative design inspiration from something outside of video games. I'm really interested in stuff like uh, comic book layout design influencing narrative design or, or film production design. So um, what was your example? Um, yeah, I think I, it's not exactly, um, I don't use storyboard, I don't use storyboards as inspiration. I haven't, uh, I mean, I do read comics, but I don't know if I've, actually at this point use them as inspiration for anything specifically but um i mean i'm a very visual person so movies is a big influence i'm always taking pictures of my my tv and sending them to claire my de my development partner to be like it would be something like oh just the framing of something i mean i was watching altered carbon one night and um the ending of before i forget was always um, always troubled me for ages so that I'd get a new build and my poor team I'd be like yeah it's good and I like this and that but the ending still doesn't work and they're like really <laughs> and I didn't know why it was broken I didn't know what was wrong I really struggled with it for a long time um, and so I was watching Altered Carbon one night and I was like oh this is really cool I just love the framing of this shot and it had this weird perspective on it so I took a took a photo and sent it to Claire and then the next time we got together we kind of it kind of solved a problem for us um and then sort of the pacing of um there was another film I can't remember what it's called because I'm uh, before I forget it's about a woman with dementia um so lots of games that deal with um sort of loss of memory or like um like losing time and sort of um, things that are non-linear um, really helped me sort of um, or helped us kind of set the pacing of this uh, certain climactic scene um, and yeah sort of some of the um, uh, sort of cinematic techniques they used um, that I thought were, we could apply to the game um, to, to help us because it, it just didn't have the climactic feeling I, it, need, it needed to have, that the story needed to have. Do you have a, um, like a specific example you could pick out of like something you saw in a scene in the film or something about a film that you like um, I think, directly put in? I think I, re I definitely rewatched Memento and uh, I, asked, I said to Claire, I was like, yeah, I think, um, you know, watch Memento because this is the kind of, the pacing on that is 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 really great, um, and I mean, no one does nonlinear quite like Christopher Nolan. <laughs> he loves that. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, sort of using jump cuts because um, you know our character with dementia would lose would lose time. Sometimes she'd sit in a chair um, and just sort of daydream an entire day away. And so the player would be sitting in this chair and then it would jump cut and we're in another room and something's changed, like the, the, the lighting's changed. So it's moved from day to night and it's, it's um, slightly, the lighting's slightly more scary. And um, yeah, things like that, just techniques like, like that. Um, and then, um, yeah, Altered Carbon, it was a scene, I think it's some weird interrogation room that um, the main character um, goes into yeah <laughs> and it just had it had this like it was bathed in this yellow light and it had this really sort of forced perspective um which we then used in um the climactic scene in the game when um she's she's really kind of unraveling um so it's yeah it's a sort of film noir sort of german expressionist you know classic um sort of cinematic framing of a scene like that um, to represent that kind of 
um, anxiety and sort of mental breakdown and things like that. So. Cool. All right. Sorry, everyone, uh, that we've had another <laughs> little bit of difficulty and uh, Sarah's dropped out, but um, hopefully she'll be back uh, in a minute. Um, so <laughs> I'm not singling you out on this question for any particular reason, Tori, but I just wanted to ask of someone, uh, what's the biggest narrative design mistake <laughs> that you've either been part of or been part of closely avoiding? Uh, oh gosh, uh, like, I think that looking back on my previous work, um, just like when I first started out, you know, just like really big chunks of dialogue was a big mistake on I, like that I could think of of something that I would go back and I would definitely change. Um, I mean, this is this isn't just writing, right? This is how do I present the dialogue to the player? Um, and, and so in Elder Scrolls, you know, you get these these windows. It's kind of like Skyrim if you've never played Elder Scrolls online. And and the character tells you this information, and then you click uh like a sentence that the player says, like, "Oh, can you tell me more?" Or "Or oh, that sounds really tough." And then so you get like you know this segmented dialogue where you're going back and forth, and you're not just saying next. You're literally saying something as the player. Um, so you're kind of creating a dialogue that's very heavy on one end, on the NPC's end, and very light on the player's end because you want to keep it to a sentence. And I feel like just uh, just making sure that you're giving only the amount of information you need and you're staying very concise is really important because you get, get overloaded with dialogue when you have too heavy of it, right? You know, um, especially when it's like, only one character is being voiced and you know and i would get to these points and i would often get the feedback of like this character is monologuing i'm not interacting with them i'm hearing them say a monologue and that's something i really struggled with because i just wanted to write kind of like how a novelist writes right like i just wanted to write what the character wanted but i had to make it so that it was quick and it was fast beat because that player is in this little narrative island of this little dialogue island of I'm going to talk to this NPC and get some information and then I'm going to want to go fight a boss, you know. Um, I was just watching this Polygon video about Valve's um, world building uh, design, uh, just to kind of throw this in here of um, for every 15 minutes of combat, they want five minutes of downtime. Uh, it's like this golden ratio. Uh, and, and that's very true with narrative design as well. You don't want a character who goes on and on and on for like this 20 minute cutscene and then have five minutes of combat and then a 20 minute cutscene. You really want it to be as interactive as possible. So you want that dialogue to be snappy and quick and just tell the player what they want when in a fun, interesting character driven, you know, like you want to have all those elements, of course, but design is knowing when to shut up, you know, your, yourself. <laughs> or your characters and when to like let the character go and fight that big boss or to explore this cool cave and you know, things like that so that's something i've really had to learn um just brevity which i'm not showing very well as i'm rambling here <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a tough one it's a tough one to learn uh cool so as we've only got a few minutes left uh i'm hoping we'll be able to get a very quick answer ideally from both of you uh on an audience question so in as few words as you can manage it. Uh, Mr. Wolf asks, um, how did you all get into narrative design and is it necessary to be a developer, i.e. a full-on coder, to become a narrative designer? Real quick. I um, was in QA for Elder Scrolls Online. I had a really good writing sample. Um, my first job at Elder Scrolls Online was more writing heavy than narrative design heavy, um, which I think gave me a great background to work with our content designers who were also narrative designers and kind of learn and, and step up to that. Um, and now I'm in a much more narrative content heavy role, which I'm much more experienced with. Um, but no, you don't need to be know how to be a programmer. It's a great background to have for any game designer to understand that. But you, there's tools in place. You're not, I'm not coding into the computer. <laughs> yeah, so go ahead. Uh. Sure. Angela? Yeah, pretty much the same. Um, I was a journalist, um, as Anthony said, and um, a writer. So, um, yeah, I just worked on my own indie game as narrative designer on that. And now I'm at Ubisoft Massive. So I'm learning the technical side and working in the editor, but I am definitely not a coder. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. Uh, I guess I'll answer because Sarah is not here, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm the same. Um, I will make entire games um, uh, without necessarily any coding experience. I tend to use uh, like visual uh, programming, I guess, plugins for Unity, um, but it doesn't require any code. And the best way to learn it, honestly, is just uh, go to game jams if you can. That's a really bad bit of advice in the current climate. But when this is all over, slash oh, on like itch.io or something, do game jams and, and other people will teach you how to use the tools. You don't need to get the code. Um, so thanks to Mr. Wolf for the question. Uh, there are uh, there were some other questions that we don't have time for, I, but I've noticed that um, Way Around Media asked one about uh, traditional film scripts. And I just want to point you in the direction of a column I wrote on exactly this for Wireframe magazine. So do some Googling, uh, like film script, game script, Wireframe, and you'll find your answer there. Um, I think we should start wrapping up. We've got, what, two minutes? So uh, does anyone have any final thoughts or anything that they want to shout about? Uh, yeah, you can find me at Tori underscore Schaefer at Twitter. If you want to ask me any questions on narrative design, my messages are open. So feel free to come on in and message me any questions. Uh, also, check out the beta of Spellbreak, www.playspellbreak.com. Have to plug it in. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the same. Definitely um, hit me up with those questions on Twitter at Shala Ramanan. Um, and if you want to check out my game, which comes out uh, this summer, it's before I forget. So that's at Threefold Games on Twitter. Um, we're on Steam, so you can wish list us. And um, yeah, uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, so if you want to know more about uh, writing and narrative design, um, uh, like I mentioned before, I, I write my column for, for Wireframe and um, I'll be tweeting out whenever that comes up, um, the entire article. Uh, so you can follow me on Twitter at Anthony underscore D underscore fault. And uh, my game Ring of Fire uh, that I creative directed is currently part of Ludo Naricon. You can download a demo and wishlist us and it would be great if you play it. It's like a hardcore detective thing. Yeah, really have to think. And it looks like Sarah's joined us for the last 30 seconds. She's <laughs> popped back in. Bye, so Sarah, do you, want to, do you want to say your goodbyes? We're just wrapping up. Okay, bye. <laughs> where, where can people find you and ask you questions? Sorry? Where can people find you and ask you questions that unfortunately you couldn't answer? Yeah, sorry about that, uh, housemate playing games. But uh, yeah, um, Twitter is the best place. Uh, my uh, handle is at Sarah Longthorn um, with an E. And um, my website is exactly the same. There's like a form on there. So yeah, feel free if you have any questions. That's yep, me. Same. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> my DMs are open as well. So yeah, hit me up on Twitter. Um, Cool, I think we should wrap it there. Um, we've been given the signal. So thank you very much for watching and thank you very much to my panelists. It's been an absolute pleasure having you and getting to speak to you face to face. Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>